it working? Okay. Uh, I'm very excited to be here because often uh, this idea that you don't actually know what's going on is a frustration for when I try to explain things. So I've decided that I'm going to start by actually allowing you to experience surfing the web in China. So I've done some screenshots before I came. Um, first, I'm going to start. The first part is with a VPN on, so you can get the idea of how slow connections are and how frustrating it is. <laughs> and I'll sort of talk through this experience with you. Um, and may, actually, before I start, let me just say, so my goal here is for you guys to really get an idea of what it feels like to be on the Chinese internet. So I'm going to really like over sense like throw a lot of things at you, okay? So just be prepared. Let's hope this works. <laughs> so uh, it looks here, I'm, I'm trying to get on Facebook. So this is Baidu, which is a Chinese search engine. It's not really loading very well with my VPN on, uh, as you can see. Um, Yahoo usually works without a VPN, but for some reason today it's not, because sometimes it's a little sketchy, a little weird. And Looking up Tumblr, yeah, Tumblr is usually not blocked also, but as you notice with my VPN, like, it's very slow, don't have a lot coming in. Yelp is barely loading. Uh, Facebook, Google, none of these seem to be really working for me. Uh, this is very frustrating, as you can imagine, especially when you're trying to do things and stay connected to the West. So, for some reason, New York Times seems to load okay, and luckily this is a GIF animation, so we don't have any streaming issues, um, which I'll talk about later also. Uh, now I've decided I'm going to turn it on and off. Oh, I'm going to turn it off. So I'm going to see if I can see any of these pages, and now I'm going to search the Chinese internet, and we're going to see actually how fast it loads without using a VPN. Look at that. <laughs> It's pretty efficient, actually, when you're not trying to get outside. Um, these are some Baidu's the search engine. Doban is actually um, kind of like a music site. Taobao is the shopping site. As you can see, this is the Chinese internet. <laughs> so uh, now I'm going to take you through Taobao a little bit. Um, just pay really close attention also to the aesthetics of this page. Um, lots of things like blinging at you. Right now I'm looking at movies. Um, now I'm going to look up cell phones. You can see how fast. You can see my options. You can see advertisement aesthetics on the side. Okay, so now I'm actually just looking at men. <laughs> and I, I want to pause it right here. <laughs> so actually what I typed in was actually just the word for man. And as you can see, I've got some really interesting project, uh, products for men. <laughs> uh, the thing is that in terms of how you can find even things you need, like certain products, if there are products like this, you can't just type in dildo and find it. So there's even a way about finding certain products online, okay? So that comes into play with sort of like creati creatively going through how to exist on this Chinese internet, right? So let's look at some of these products. Well, so pornography may be illegal in China, but toys are not. <laughs> so these are just a few examples. Um, that I, and I'm kind of previewing this because I want you to understand that the culture is incredibly vibrant and everyone has the same desires. So there's options. <laughs> um, however, uh, actually, if you notice back there, I don't know if I can go back because I've been having trouble with the video, but you notice how there were stickers on and, and like kind of censoring certain parts of the image? I want you to keep that aesthetic in mind because we're going to talk about that again also. Uh, let's see. So now I'm looking up Germany. <laughs> And look at all the beer. <laughs> Some of it's real German beer, most of it's fake German beer. <laughs> and just in case you need some birthday shampoo, uh, we have that in China also. <laughs> I tailored this for the Germans. <laughs> um, this is a streamy. I'm just, 
I'm going to kind of stop soon just to show you how fast video also streams. Yoku is basically like YouTube. And it's pronounced Yoku, not Yuku, by the way. Um, so yeah, you can see that video actually streams quite quickly. Um, yeah, we got some dancers. Yeah, I think you get the idea of the aesthetic and uh, kind of what it's like, the differences between trying to access the Western web in China versus actually just existing on the local platform. Um, so let's move in and talk about what that means. So the Chinese internet. I like to call it the chinternet. Essentially, it's obviously a cross of Chinese and internet. And essentially, it means um, an internet with Chinese characteristics, OK? That's what we're going to kind of talk a lot about today. Now, the thing that we have to understand is it has its own ecosystem. It has its own existence in a way of like doing things, right? So instead of Facebook and Twitter, we have Weibo and QQ. Instead of Google, we have Baidu. YouTube, Yoku. eBay and Etsy, Taobao, Alibaba. WhatsApp, WeChat. OK? So everything that you have outside of the Chinese internet exists inside of the Chinese internet. OK? So this idea that it's a desolate or barren or empty landscape is very untrue. OK? And that's what I really want to talk to you about today. So the biggest difference at this point in the history of the Chinese internet is that it actually mostly exists on a device like this. So thinking about that, um, if you think about most of us in this room probably first accessed the internet through a very large computer. It was expensive. It was slow. It was dial up. So we had a certain expectation for how to surf the internet, right? Um, at this point in China's history, the majority of people experiencing the internet for the first time are experiencing it through a mobile device, okay? So their expectation for how they interact, for how they maneuver through things, the speed at which it goes is very different from most of us. We also have to consider this. So um, this is a really funny advertising from Weixin or WeChat, which is one of the biggest mobile app platforms, and it keeps getting bigger and bigger. And in this, it basically says that they are going to change the world. <laughs> so, and, and that's kind of what I'm going to talk about. So um, that moves me on to my research, which is partly anthropological and also partly performative. Um, I call it the Chinternet Archive. <laughs> so to explain the Chinternet Archive, what I use is something called People Nearby. And it's a function in the app that lets me use the location-based uh, services of my device and access other people. In, and I think it's around a 1,000 kilometer or 1,000 meter radius. So it's very location-based, OK? A lot of what I've collected for this archive has come from places like Beijing and Shanghai, Guilin, Shenzhen, Xi'an. I think there's like six different Chinese cities, also Korea, Texas, now Germany. So <laughs> what I'm showing you is how I access this. So this is, if I were to go and view people nearby, this is what I would find in different areas. <laughs> So it get, becomes very interesting, um, the fact that it is location-based. Because everywhere I go, I find out new things about how people interact with this app and exactly what is their relationship to China. Because this is a Chinese app, it is owned by a Chinese internet company, so it is a part of the Chinternet. Okay? And so here's San Antonio, Texas, where I was briefly before I came here. And here's Germany. <laughs> And what I found in Germany is actually it's mostly um, German men and a lot of like Turkish, Iraqi um, people, which I wasn't surprised. WeChat has um, a reputation in the Middle East already. So I wanted just to give you an idea of how this happens, OK? And I kind of go through and I start looking through profiles. Any profile that has It tells me that I can look up to 10 posts, which means they've kept their account open. So 
I go through and I collect images in open accounts like this or profile images, so they're all public images. So what do I do with these images? Uh, well, I'm looking for patterns and collections and I'm trying to find out what, what's going on in China in the virtual world. A lot of times you can view what I am as a, like sort of a document, uh, documentarian, so I'm a documentary photographer because a lot of these are actually screenshots. This is an example again to look at the aesthetic of the Chinese internet. Okay, we have a lot of busyness, a lot of color, a lot of bling, <laughs> a lot of different text in the same image. It's a little overwhelming. One of the artists that I work with is, uh, her name's Ying Mao, and I'll talk about her later. She likes to describe the Chinese internet as an internet ecstasy. <laughs> okay, so let's keep that in mind as we move forward. So, what do I find in most? I'm going to show you a few sets of things I find quite often. And one of them, oh, actually, we're going to talk about graphics. I'm sorry. So again, here we're just reinforcing that internet ecstasy feeling. Notice all the hearts. Um, and actually, this is what a, an open moments page looks like. So if I, go, if I can go into an account, this is what I'm looking at. And then below that will be the posts that they make. Okay, this is a really great example. <laughs> we have a few things going on here. <laughs> we have a Chinese lamp. We have some roses, some Christmas candles and presents. And what does it say? It says, greetings, good morning, good morning. It says good morning in two ways. <laughs> Zao Shang Hao and Zao An, same meaning. <laughs> but they decided that it was necessary to say it twice. So again, this gives you an idea of how things sort of get mixed up and it's just piecing together when it comes to aesthetics. Um, so this is probably a retailer and she's probably selling beads like this. What she's using to make the, this edited part is uh, a Chinese app called Meitu Xiuxiu. Um, I've used it a lot myself. And guess what? Chinese people use it a lot too. <laughs> Um, so I, this is a very common aesthetic is this sort of overload and if we think about that early Taobao page where everything was blinging and everything was boom, bam, whatever, it starts to translate in every part of life in China. <laughs> But I think it's really quite special. Um, he's saying, like, ha like, have a great, it's a great time. He is, look, he's having a great time. So now let's say we're going to have a traditional picture. Um, we still need to have some chaos. If you notice all the different patterns everybody's wearing on their shirts. And if you also notice the background, we have bling on the background. So you can't escape this. It's beautiful. So this is actually a photograph I took in the park. I like to spend a lot of time in the park because I think what I do on the Chinese internet is kind of like, it's a virtual landscape. So often I look at what I do as if it's like a virtual street that I'm walking down and I'm seeing things. But sometimes for me to understand those things, I actually need to exist in real life, which is why I live in China. So I spend a lot of time at the park because it gives me a, a really, um, a nice place to see a lot of diverse types of people. So, <laughs> Do you notice his aesthetic, this mis mismatching in his shirt and its chaos? So this internet aesthetic exists in the physical form. It is everywhere, okay? So we're gonna talk about that more later too. So I'm telling a little story, so if you haven't gotten that yet. <laughs> so what are some other things that I have in my archive? Lots of hearts. So this is a funny one because um, to play, you know, a lot of the way that things work on the Chinese internet is word play and number play. So in this case, um, 520 is in Chinese, Wu Arling, but it sounds a little bit like I love you in Chinese, which is Wu Ai Ni. So they've decided that if you make 520, it means I love you without actually having to say it or use the characters. So this is internet speak in China. 
<laughs> and it's interesting because in WeChat, it allows you sometimes during like Valentine's Day or different holidays, if you type 520, little hearts will float down the screen. It's very interactive. Also something to consider. The experience online in China is very interactive. Moving on. So someone made a nice dinner for his love, and there's crabs and the heart candle. Somebody's decided that their dog needs a heart. Food in shapes of heart. Roses. Shrimp. This is a particularly beautiful one, I think. Um, they get very, very creative with their hearts, let me tell you. Um, see, we could even, why not on your desktop have one? And why not post an actual heart? <laughs> this is a, f a heart of a 38-year-old woman. So that moves into another portion, which is um, how actually like explicit posts can be. There's not the same kind of censoring for gruesome things, okay? So I, it's very interesting. I find a lot of injuries. Like I find a lot of people posting injuries. Um, very vivid ones. In the far like left, it actually, they're very straight lines, so it's kind of, yeah. <laughs> it could be self-induced. I also find a lot with um, IVs in the hospital. Um, so these are common. And that moves into the hand ones. <laughs> I have so many images like this, and they're very random. It's like an object in their hand. Sometimes their hand is doing something. Sometimes the object's doing something. Sometimes they're just holding it. But what I really want you to pay attention to is how actually when you start to look at these, it almost looks like you're entering that space yourself, right? It has this perspective of virtual experience, right? Like that first person. So like, let's, let's keep that in, in mind also, OK? So this is the circle of life. Yeah, I find, I don't know why I find this quite often also. Um, <laughs> food, you'll notice on the second row, middle row, there's a nice one that's a little surprising. You don't catch that usually. Um, um, I get to see in people's houses, so I get to see what their house looks like, what kind of technology they're using. Um, this is a whole series of TVs, um, which I'm going to move into the houses a little bit. I get to have like a very intimate perspective of how people are living in China, and it's varied, actually. I have images inside of migrant homes or mi migrant dormitories inside of student dormitories, inside of very, very wealthy people. So there's a very huge economic diversity in the country as well. Um, the aesthetic we saw earlier, it's kind of happening here too, right? Do you see it? Not as extreme, but it's there. Um, so here's some other ones. There's always pictures of food. This one's quite funny. He's got a bottle, uh, Yes, My Wine. But I don't think it's actually the original name, because that looks like a sticker on top of the original um, label. And the Chinese name is actually Ye Mai Jiu, which sounds like, yes, my, <laughs> my wine. So it's sort of a funny wordplay. And these are a bowl of chicken feet. So this is a, a really interesting cultural pairing, because wine is not a traditional, red wine is not a traditional alcohol beverage of China. It's something imported. We also have Tylenol, also something imported, and something very traditional, which is the chicken feet. And beautiful, beautiful still lives of all kinds of interesting objects. Um, I'm sort of showing this because in the archive, there's also a lot of different qualities of, um, of resolution, which can reveal to me um, demographic as well, what kind of phone they have. This is a beautiful still life also. So I'm going to kind of move into Apple products are also something very heavily made fun of in China by Chinese people because it's a status thing. So I'll just quickly go through these. <laughs> we have, yeah, we have a few uh, uh, iPhone 7. <laughs> That's a nice one. Um, so yeah, some more technology. These are webcams in different, most of these are from gaming, um, like. Um, uh, like internet cafes, 
people covering. This kind of comes back to the topic of um, when people do want to when people do want to censor themselves because they do know the degree of which images are used, they will do it intentionally, and they use different apps um, to do that in kind of funny ways. She's done an interesting job here. <laughs> <laughs> she's, it says, hey, hey, <laughs> and it's a smiley face next to it. She's also blurred out everything around her. These are also some important things to consider. Face, there's a heart again. Um, so this is Tianjin, and I'm realizing that I actually might have to jump through some stuff. Um, yeah because I'm gonna run out of time and that's the only thing. I want you guys to actually be able to see some um, artwork also. But I am gonna talk about this meme, which is quite funny. Um, there was one day, um, not too long ago, we had many weeks of smog. <laughs> And then there was this glorious rainbow, and everybody's feed looked like this in Beijing, just over and over and over of rainbows. So actually, one artist in my feed made a beautiful rainbow picture in honor of it. And what was interesting about this was that the meme only lasted as long as the sun set. By the time the sun had actually set, all of the images, all of the jokes, all of the pictures um, were basically gone, and what was left was, um, this amazing GIF animation <laughs> for a meme that only lasted two hours max. It's pretty good, really. Um, yeah. <laughs> so money is really big, lots of money, um, piles of money especially. Uh, monies and phones, also really big. Uh, notice that they're Apple phones, although they could be fake ones, I'm not sure. Um, so these are collections that I do. I post every day in my WeChat moments to sort of, uh, as a daily performance of um, showing and revealing and learning more about these images as an archiving collection. So it's been installed actually at uh, eProject Space, which is owned by a uh, German and Hungarian women. Um, and in a show called Wang Wang Wang, which is internet, internet, internet. <laughs> and I typically will install it on a mobile device and so people can come in and they actually can witness it because I post every day. So it's a performance in real time. So that brings me to the art portion, which I'm thinking I still have time for. Um, I started a project as a result of this. Um, the archive began because my research partner, um, Gabriele Desetti, he's actually a media anthropologist specifically focused on Chinese internet. And he was the one that introduced me to all of this. We started a band and then we started researching. <laughs> but. Uh, we, he proposed that we write a paper looking um, at Chinese selfies initially, and so I spent, that's how the archive started actually two years ago. And I spent eight months with just collecting selfies. Uh, and during that time I realized I wanted to understand more because there was all this amazing stuff happening. And that's how it beca became what it is. And so the archive now is about mm, 20,000 or more images, so it's a small data but it's very telling and revealing, as you saw earlier. Um, and this influenced, I was already researching artists dealing with technology in China because um, I come from an internet background, tech art ba background, and the Chinese internet is a whole new landscape. And I was getting bored of the Western web, and I thought to myself, man, this is a whole new place that we don't know anything about, and I bet there's some interesting art happening too. So I moved to China four years ago <clears throat> to do this, um, and then started this archive two years ago, which is basically, the, the pairing of the archive and the work with artists is, <clears throat> excuse me, important because I have a very, in-depth cultural perspective of what's happening in China that influences for influences in how I can understand the art and what's being expressed and why. Um, and that's very important to understand. So I started uh, Netizenet, and it's actually a play. Um, Netizen, which is citizen and internet, came out of 1984. Um, not the book, but life. <laughs> Um, and at the time, it was a word coined in the West for unified web freedom. 
But for some reason, they use this word um, to describe Chinese internet users because when internet sort of entered China, it was a unified experience. It was the first time the country could sort of connect across all over the place and sort of voice and share op in their ideas and opinions and anything else. And so this is why they were referring to, they refer to Chinese netizens, okay? So a play on that. Uh, to make the Chinese name, because I need a Chinese name, uh, it's Wang Yo Wang, which is just Internet Friend Network. <laughs> and what that actually translates to, it's referring to the early years of BBS boards and chat groups, right? A lot of people made very, very close friends on the Internet in the early years. So with NetisonNet, I'm looking at a lot of things. And I started commissioning, um, New Hive was supporting some of this. Um, I'm moving a lot into interviews. My biggest thing is I like to interview these artists and ask things like, when do you remember hearing about the internet? <laughs> What's the first piece of technology? I'm very interested in creating a timeline of experience with the history of technology in China also. So my first artist was Ying Miao, and she did, <laughs> she did a nice little show online for us, um, and she named it Meanwhile in China, which is a Western meme, but so in love, we'll never feel tired again. And it's quite, so tired is spelled wrong, and that was a, a Chinglish, Chinglish accident that she made, and then we decided to keep it because it was very appropriate. So she did, I'm not going to talk about all of it, but she did one piece um, where we ended up splitting the screen. This is a video that um, comes from this meme. There was a meme with a kid born in the 90s who wrote like, um, so in love, we'll never feel tired again, and ended up becoming viral. And then somebody, this is a, an example of a website called bilibili.com, which allows people to stream their own videos and then comments just run across. <laughs> it's very interactive, right? And um, so she splits it. It's actually in Yoku and in YouTube. And so when you're in China, you can't see the YouTube side. <laughs> And when you're in the Western world, uh, Yoku like, loads very, very slowly. So this piece specifically is straddling both internets at the same time. Um, if you want to see it, I'll give you the website later, um, and you can go through it. So the one thing, actually, the first piece that she did dealing with the internet was in 2007 called The Blind Spot. She spent three months taking a dictionary, a Chinese dictionary, and a list of Google censored words and blanked them out. So this is the first piece I'd ever found that was really directly dealing with what the internet was in China at that time. That was in 2007. Which leads me to uh, Funya. She was doing some screen paintings in 2008. And this one is particularly interesting because if you notice, it's a Google CN. Um, in 2010, Google left China because um, they were not into the censorship issue or censorship laws that were going into place, and they routed everything to Hong Kong. So this is a really interesting piece because it's documenting a screen that no longer exists for a very specific reason. And she's gaming. So that interactivity thing is a really big thing to understand about the Chinese internet. It's an experience. Um, this is Wei Yi Li, and she's quite interesting because she um, is the first artist who's also curating works online. She has an online gallery called, um, sorry, called BigBadGallery.com. She does some really interesting projects, so if you want to know it later, ask me. Um, so this piece is called Oriental Giants, and she actually, what she does, I can try to access it. She um, might not load. We've been having trouble with loading. Uh, basically, what she did is sort of a uh, like an open source crowd surfing project where she's trying to get people to send her images and information about like giant Mao Zedong statues around the country, and she's creating a statistical map, <laughs> ironically on Google Maps, <laughs> of um, things in the um, of these like giant Mao statues all over the country. 
And this is interesting. She's, so Katie's is actually an American, and she did a project, she's working on a project called Human Spam. The biggest experience um, with mobile devices is the way that information is flooded. People are so connected, you don't ever not have your phone. You never log off, literally. So she was doing some pieces where she was actually spamming everyone and like only regurgitating information. And this is a play on sort of when you lose the search engine actually and you don't have that browser to go explore the internet and you're functioning mostly in something like WeChat, everything becomes, oh, what happened? <laughs> Did I press something? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, so this says, ah, ha, ha, ha. So it's kind of funny that it's laughing at us. Um, I don't know what happened. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, let me find where I was. Anyways, so th her work with human spam is this basically this idea that if you're you know, if you lose the search engine, then basically you're losing like that exploratory factor to go and find things. And so what happens is information just gets like regurgitated, it's in cycles. So it kind of feels like this, you're just seeing all this same stuff over and over again. That's kind of what it feels like on the Chinese internet now. This is something she did, I can play very quickly playing on this, and it just shows you the interactivity. So she types in, she pastes from somebody else's um, miss you. And this is, see, when you say certain things, stuff flies down the screen. So um, the, like I said, the experience is very much about interactivity, which means the virtual world is a very special place. It means you're always connected together and never logging off. So that virtual world experience and that real life experience are exactly the same thing. That's very different from the West. We may think that we're always logged on, but not like this, I promise you. So this is Aspertime. They did another piece commissioned by New Hive um, for Netizenet. And they're playing on this idea. It's called Nine Computer Exercises for the 21st Century Online Digital Interactive Era, <laughs> which is a great title. And it's based off of um, this idea in Chinese, there's daily routine and daily practice. It's a part of the culture. And so they're sort of playing on this digital era and the idea of how do we exist when this is that reality, when we are always interacting, when we're always online. This is an example of the piece. So it gives you instructions, each, each slide gives you instructions. So, yeah. Um, they also did some pieces, we're using Taobao, where they, where they were called ideas, and they would ask people to make art for them. So in this one, they're asking you to find a bunch of stuff the same weight, like a pile of books, a bunch of pork, and um, like weigh them and take photographs for them. Um, th this one's quite funny. They're asking someone to buy this piece by, and make it themselves. And what they have to do is get us like a stage smoke machine and like stage this whole scene and take photographs and videos and then like send it back. Again, that's an artist playing off of that interactivity. Um, I asked them about uh, Cheng Yu's a traditional idiom or poem in four characters, and I asked them to make one up for the Chinese internet. So they have which is mysterious, you can't imagine how deep it is, difficult to guess or comprehend. This is a Chinese person's like, perspective of the internet in China. This is happening right now by uh, performance artist Beo and Funa, Funa Ye, which we saw earlier, she did that Google CN painting. They're doing it through a, an app called 51rebo.com, which is like a domestic live streaming, so you can have your own like reality show. Um, what I wanna show you, these are some screenshots. So what you're seeing here <laughs> is that virtual and real world paired together. So they took, actually this is a friend who did this. This is an image she took at the studio while they were recording. And she, realized it didn't have that right aesthetic, so she went and blurred it and put, she used Xu Xu Miu Miu and like, or Miu, yeah, Mei Xu Xu and like 
basically blurred the whole thing to make it feel right. Um, and she did this in the di digital realm, right? Because then she could share it properly on the internet. This is actually just what the scene in <laughs> the live broadcastings actually look like. Okay, so that physical, that virtual, they're all real. They're the same thing. This is what the app looks like when you're featuring it. And it's, again, it's interactive. Everyone's bam, 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 giving you images, giving you content. It's super sensory overload. Um, so Wang Nguyen is interesting for her quote. I'm sorry I'm rushing. I kind of over-prepared. Um, I asked her like what she considered herself, and she said that she saw herself in different physical forms and identities um, in the virtual world. And she sees herself actually becoming less and less in real life and more integrated online. So I'm seeing this consistently with artists working with technology. The body is losing entire meaning. Identity is losing meaning. And the virtual existence or the reinvention or creation that comes with virtual life is prim primarily what they're sort of moving into, which if you think about what we saw earlier, digitizing the real life, like that seamlessness of virtual and physical, and the way that something like WeChat is everything. It's centralized. You can have boyfriends and girlfriends and pay, get taxis, pay your bills. So um, that leads me to Wang Xin, okay? Thinking about that virtual world. She did a eight hertz hypnosis lab. Thinking about that mind, focusing on that mind, and actually losing the body. Um, also looks very chinternet, right, inside. So she does hypnosis, and she's actually moving more into VR with Oculus now. And I asked her about like, what this experimentation is about, and what she wants to create and she's working on at the moment is um, VR hypnosis. She wants to actually basically have an entire experience that's entirely mental and dimensional on like many different levels of perception. Because if you imagine what hypnosis is, it's about going and sort of figuring out the issues or dealing with issues, right? So that leads me to my conclusion. <laughs> uh, this is also from the archive. What I'm leading to is that this is actually an example for all of us of what's sort of happening in the world as we continue to um, advance with mobile technology. It's not a doomsday thing. It's just a reality we have to consider and we have to think about what this means in um, legislature, in choices, in production of materials, all of these things. So this basically this says that the internet is like opium <laughs> 100 years ago, 100 years now. A uh, hundred years later, um, and this is made by a Chinese person. However, it's in a traditional um, uh, um, Han. It's it's not um, simplified Chinese. It's traditional. So I don't know if this could actually be from Hong Kong or Taiwan, maybe, um, or very far south, um, because in mainland we use um, uh, simplified usually. So. You know, China is the first country in the world to actually. Um, officially like say that internet addiction is a serious psychological problem. Um, yeah, I see it every day. Again, we have that pairing <laughs> side by side of the digitizing of real life and real life wanting to become a cyborg. These are also from my archive. Um, and I, what I'm trying to say is that in this massive like um, archive, I'm, I'm seeing these trends emerging. I'm seeing how life is becoming digital and virtual and less and less physical. And as we can see here, uh, he's already ready. <laughs> and he's, he's like thinking about it. <laughs> he's like, I'll try this on. So what do we do with this idea? Well, I think there comes a little of this first. <laughs> I think first we, we need to keep a sense of humor. And as we can see from a lot of some of the memes and some of the content that I've shown, um, the Chinese internet has a great sense of humor actually. So even considering you know, everything that is happening and that it's a walled garden, 
Um, it is flourishing. It has its own digital landscape, and it's affecting creativity in very fascinating ways. And that's actually what I am most interested about my studies, is looking at how do limitations actually begin to emerge new ideas or experiences. And the reality is the entire world is becoming virtual and digital. And so we all need to be considering like what direction we take with this. Um, and I suppose, yes, yeah. It's thank you in Chinese. <laughs> That's okay. All right. Uh, we have plenty of time left for questions and answers. Oh, yeah. So if you have questions about the very interesting Chinese <laughs> internet, please come to one of the Saul mics. Um, so everybody can hear you. And I think we'll start with a question from the interwebs. Yes, the internet would like to know, uh, is it common for Baidu to track and analyze uh, Wang users or web users' behavior for statistics like Google Analytics does or um, like it's done in, in the Western world, I guess? Sorry? I didn't, under I didn't understand. Uh, the, the question is, uh, is it common for Baidu to track and analyze uh, web users' behavior? Baidu? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't study Baidu. I mean, I study user interactivity in WeChat, so I'm specifically looking at like how people exist in this app. So that's not my specialty. I'm sorry. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, then we move to the mic over there. Is this on? Hi, thanks Hi. for this. This is uh, great to see that it's so vibrant and interactive. Yeah, and such. of course. There was a documentary that came out about a year ago called China's Web Junkies, um, where uh, children who were addicted to gaming or like just the internet in general were put in these boot camps, uh, military style boot camps, in order to break them of the yeah. habit. Um, could you speak a little bit more of like how the culture, the older generation and the younger generation are kind of interacting over the internet and technology and their creativity and their vibrancy? Um, you know, in, in my archive, I actually have a lot of diversity of age as well. So there are a lot of older people that are interacting in WeChat, for sure. So it's becoming commonplace. And part of that is because most business is done, a lot of business, not most. I'll say a lot of business is done through WeChat. The centralization of the app also plays into this virtual, like, constant virtual experience because you can pay your rent, you can have a virtual girlfriend and boyfriend, a virtual secretary, you can get a taxi, you can use people nearby for hooking up, you can um, chat, video chat, group chat, um, you, there's retailers, people sell everything. So in terms of that interactivity, I see mostly like in term, like older people, they tend to be businessmen or retailers. So they're using it specifically for e-commerce. With younger people, it's definitely more about sharing and broadcasting. I, I <laughs> quite funny, I had a retailer WeChat friend and she put me in a mother's group of 100 Chinese women once. <laughs> And it was immensely fascinating. It was like every morning at 7 a.m., they're all talking about what they're going to feed their kids, what kind of detergent they should use, like where can they buy this or that. So the group chats are really functioning as discussion platforms for people to connect and solve, um, solve issues in their life, um, and also to share information. Yeah. Does that help? Uh, yeah, great. Thank you. <laughs> cool. All right, then we'll just stick with that mic and your question, your question, please. Thank you for a great talk. It was very interesting. Uh, I have a question. Could you please uh, say a bit about uh, online dating in China? What is the perspective? How do people, both men and women, advertise themselves? I believe you know something about it. Study. <laughs> I mean, in your study. And from the perspective of a foreign woman or? <laughs> no, uh, I mean it's professionally. <laughs> you, you do study internet, so that's what I meant actually. Um, <laughs> well, I, I mean, I don't know personally. I, I don't use any Chinese dating apps. Um, they are used, I mean, with my experience, when I first started the archive, I actually, my profile was a Chinese woman, like a very beautiful Chinese woman. And so I was <laughs> doing this because I really wanted to see what kind of natural interactions were happening. 
And sure enough, two years ago, it was just lists and lists of men contacting me. Very rarely was it women. So I'm finding that definitely this people nearby function is used for dating. And while I've been in Germany and other parts of the world using it, I see the same thing. Uh, because I, I don't know that a lot of Germans maintain people nearby function in Germany for Chinese business, because I'm finding it's mostly Germans or Turkish or Middle Eastern. So that tells me it looks like it's more interactive for dating. In Texas, it was weirder because um, my profile is still ambiguous, and I, they thought I was Chinese. So it was a lot of like white men contacting me um, in broken Chinglish, <laughs> like in broken like characters, trying I think thinking I'm Chinese. Um, in terms of other areas, I'm not familiar. I don't use Chinese dating apps, so yeah, I can only give my perspective. So yeah, is that oh. okay? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Then uh, switch over to the other side of the room. Um, I would like to ask you if you're uh, sure that you haven't been trolled, maybe, by the culture. Because if I was looking at my tw Twitter uh, timeline and the regular timelines of maybe professional Twitters, uh, that would be the same cultural um, well discrepancy, I would say. So you're saying that I'm trolling? No, 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 oh, no. Oh, being I, trolled. Yeah, it's like uh, image board culture compared compared to uh, maybe Facebook or, um, well, maybe like Nine Gag. It's a bit more intense, maybe. I mean, again, it comes back to like the 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 purposes for use are are going to be different in China because the cultural context is different. So if the apps used for centralization of most experiences. Um, I, the reason I know that the men contacting me are interested in hookup is because of the things that they say. No, no I mean... Oh, I'm with, sorry. With Did I the, misunderstand? No, I didn't, I didn't reflect on that. I just... Oh, yeah. About the talk in, itself, in general. About... I'm sorry? About the talk itself. Oh, the talk itself? About yeah. trolling? No. The, the images you showed, maybe they were just not serious. Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of the images are incredibly playful, but that's a part of, like, the culture. That's a part of, like, uh, <laughs> online experience is not being serious and humorous. Yeah, I guess. It's a part of the meme culture. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. <laughs> All right, then we'll maybe move to another question from Twitter or IRC. Uh, IRC would like to know if you have uh, experience or comments on Chinese image boards. Um, uh, Chinese like BBS boards? Yeah. Um, I can't talk about that. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, thanks. <laughs> For a number of reasons. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I will say this, I will say this. From what I understand, like from many of the artists that I interview about their early experiences, like BBS boards were like were the first sort of point of um, interaction. And you didn't have streaming sites in the beginning, so everything was sort of shared with links and links, and people would create portals sort of um, outside of the Chinese web and send links to share certain kinds of content through BBS boards. I have heard of one BBS boards that was made for Chinese men who want to pick up white girls. And so they give you, they all talk about giving each other by advice of how to get a foreign girl. <laughs> for Chinese men. So it's, yeah. Sounds nice. Um, another question <laughs> from, from... No, I guess from that uh, is your dating question also. <laughs> hang, hang on a sec. I think your mic's not on yet. Just repeat the question, please. Uh, have you taken a look at the uh, opposite side? Like if there's a Chinese person doing the same thing for the Western internet? I don't know. Actually, I haven't. Is there? <laughs> Does anyone know? I think it would be very hard because, y you know, for me to collect this amount of image, you have to have a database and a f like a, f um, a function that allows you to collect images in this way that's location based. So the fact that it's a radius of people when I turn on people nearby means that the characteristics, the kind of images I'm getting are based on location. So when I was in Korea, you know, I'm finding images that relate to why Chinese people are in Korea. A lot of it's like buying makeup. So there's tons of piles of hotel rooms with makeup everywhere and suitcases. 
Now, imagine if I went to places like Africa, where China is actually um, investing in infrastructure, and you have a lot of Chinese workers building railroads, things like this. Um, I would also have a very particularly location-based sense um, um, content um, that tells me what's happening in Africa in relationship to China. And that's what's quite interesting is we have this idea of the Chinese internet being something only based in China. But like I said, WeChat is still the Ch internet. It's still a Chinese internet with characteristics of Chinese culture. It's related and it's based in China and it's mobile. And so that begins to show us actually what role China has on a much larger global scale because it's a location-based feature. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, then switch over there. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I would expect that, that people uh, interact quite differently online depending on audience, so like whether they're, they're talking to their, their, uh, their work colleagues or their family or their friends. Could you maybe talk about how that affects the kind of uh, uh, visual styles and, and how, they kind of how they behave? Yeah, I mean, I have people in my feed that I don't want to see things. So you can actually block people from seeing your moments. And this is the really like interesting um, function of the fact that WeChat is also um, group chats and, and individual chats. So what actually happens is these individualized groups exist. And they're formatted or they become about topics or a group of people with a shared interests. And so that becomes the, carp, you know, putting everything in little boxes. <laughs> um, that's part of it. Um, I've also talked to young Chinese students, and there's, I, I know a few that they use um, QQ more with their friends, and they use WeChat more with their parents, and that seems to be a platform. The difference in platform allows them to separate that as well. Yeah. OK, perfect. Um, yeah. Your talk. Uh, thanks for your talk. I have a short question. Did you experience any situation when a Chinese person was so surprised by, let's say, kind of Western content? Like, did you show anything which is special for, let's say, Western internet to the Chinese person and it seemed so weird as this stuff seemed weird for us? I'm trying to think because, you know, a lot of the kind of people I would show that to would be artists or like very open-minded creative people. And most of them already have VPNs. Most of them have already studied abroad typically because it's an education class thing. Um, I think that's the other thing we have to consider is that when we talk about people who are really walled in this walled garden, they're of a certain class, right? Because when you do have a certain education background or you come from a certain demographic, you have opportunity to travel. And so you get experience on Western webs. And then if you come back to China, you want to stay connected to your new Western friends. So you have things like VPNs or you just use WeChat because WeChat, you know, the reason I use it and my parents use it is because it's the quickest, most reliable way to stay in touch without me having to use that slow VPN. So that's also something to consider. Yeah, it sort of like jumps over that wall a little bit. Thanks. Okay, um, yeah, the mic to the right, please. Hey, yeah, also thanks a lot for the talk. It was super interesting uh, that you showed this kind of parallel internet, but then in terms of the net art or the Chinese artists, I thought it was very similar to, well, Western net art, and uh, how much do you think these two like influence each other? Yeah, yes. because ultimately a lot of these um, artists who are working, you know, the, the, lands, the art market landscape in China is still very, very traditional. So artists who are working with technology or the internet are the much younger generation. And so they're already a little internet savvy and are familiar with the Western web. So yeah, of course they've been influenced. You know, what happens is like we have a global aesthetic now um, across the web. We all sort of adopt. Um, you, you can see this if you go to like most cities, hipster culture exists everywhere in Africa, in South America, in China. Like, so there is sort of a global aesthetic. And so that, those influences still exist in China, which is why you're seeing some similarities. I would say the differences come in the platforms themselves or the cultural context. 
for example, their personal influences or something like using WeChat that are very Chinese specific. But yeah. Okay, I see one more question from the other side. The uh, last image that you showed to me was kind of very political in the sense that it referenced the great, uh, the century of great humiliation and then it referenced like traditional imagery, no traditional lettering. Um, could you talk more about the political context of that image or if there was one? I mean, I don't see the political context most of the time in images like that because I'm like, images like that are very common and they're commonly posted. Like Chinese people use meme-like imagery to sort of comment on those kinds of things. And so it's, it's almost like a sol solidarity factor. It's like, this is the situation that we're in, what, let's laugh about it. <laughs> and that's a part of feeling like, we all get it now, what's going to, I mean, what's happening? I think there's, you know, it's, it's a country that's changing incredibly fast. And when you have an economy that moves that fast, it's a little bit ahead of society in terms of the way of thinking. And so there's a lot of like lag. I think there was uh, what Alvin told, Future Shock, I don't know if you've ever read this book. It's this idea of like um, you have the people who are like ahead and then there's this, this society that's moving at a certain speed and certain technological advances or societal things are ahead of us and then humans are not quite ready for it. And so it becomes this like shock of the future at the speed. I sometimes feel like that in China. Sometimes I really feel like I'm existing in an alternative future. And I think everyone feels this, and it's going by very, it's really, really fast. And so what happens is it ends up being translated into like endless, endless memes like this um, that also talk about politics. And that's the easiest way to talk about politics is with humor. Um, that's, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Sure. So I don't see any more questions in the room, but we have another one from the internet. Uh, the internet would like to know what is your favorite Chinese cinematic movie? My current Chinese? Favorite Chinese cinematic movie. I don't, I don't like Chinese movies. <laughs> <laughs> That's the <laughs> truth, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah, then there's another room question. I was wondering, I was, I was wondering in, uh, in terms of censorship and this being a very big platform, if you have any data on uh, how things are censored um, on, on, on any topic of that. Yeah, so some background on me. I actually, I grew up in Saudi Arabia in my early childhood, but my parents are Americans. So when you're a foreigner in Saudi Arabia in the 80s, you're monitored pretty extremely. So I grew up with a very like high awareness for this. And so self-censorship is something very natural to me, which is also why I was interested in the Chinese internet. Generally, censorship happens with the person first. Like, um, it's really a, uh, there's parts of like um, the internet, for example, they realized very fast that um, in Weibo that if you, you know, typed certain text, it could easily, code could be written to basically censor that very quickly, right? So to get creative, they realized, oh, you could have a JPEG of text and this could spread around really fast before it was taken down. So that innovation, there's a lot of that c comes out, is this creative innovation to deal with the situation. It plays on language, it plays on formats, um, and then it plays in memes. Again, these memes sort of become something that generate the solidarity of experience. So, um, yeah, it always starts with self-censorship, to be honest, yeah. Thanks. Okay, so um, I don't see any more questions and we are almost out of time, so thanks again, Michelle. Sure.